And then I cry, what wonderful grace What wonderful grace Forgotten Truths is brought to you by people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us today for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today, and we do trust that our time together in God's Word will prove a rich blessing and help to you. Our purpose here and our study each week is to help you to understand and enjoy the Bible. And we look at God's Word from a, from a believing point of view. We, we try to study the Bible from a mid-Acts dispensational viewpoint. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means we're just simply trying to obey Paul's instructions when he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The, ver the only verse in the Bible, and you have to have a King James Bible, even have this verse, that tells you to study the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15, tells you how to do it. That tells you why to do it to seek God's approval. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Our desire is not to have the approval of the religious system or some preacher or some denomination or some uh, school of thought. It isn't to be consistent with the historic Christian faith and all that kind of stuff. It's really to be approved unto God, to have God's approval. You know, the path of faith is wearying to the flesh. And you look down through church history and you'll see that uh, uh, that's true. But to have God's approval is the key. How do you do it? Well, you got, first you've got to study the book. You've got to get in God's words. You've got to understand the word of God. You, it, studying the Bible is more than just reading the Bible. It's giving some attention and some time to learning the word of God. You say, well, how do you do that? It's just such a big book. Well, he tells you, thank goodness rightly dividing the word of truth. That's just simply the dispensational approach to Scripture. When you t come to the word of God, you need to study it dispensationally, recognizing the distinctions that God has placed in his word. When you begin reading the epistles of the Apostle Paul, it doesn't take long before you realize that at the early stage of every one of Paul's epistles, he, he says something uh, that, that many people, most commentaries, in fact almost all of them, misunderstand or at least fail to understand. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, for example, uh, Paul is an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren that are with me under the churches of Galatia. Now listen, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. When Paul says, grace be to you from God the Father, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Most of the time commentaries look at that and they say, well, grace is the, is the, the Greek way of saying hello and peace, shalom. That's the, the, the Hebrew way of greeting. And this is just Paul's Jew, greeting to Jews and Gentiles. But you know, there's far more than that in this passage. When Paul begins his epistles by saying, grace be to you and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. He's really stating at the very beginning of each epistle the official attitude of God the Father and God the Son toward the world today. Now that's important because in verse 4 there, he told you something about the world. He said, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice Paul's description of the world today as the evil world. The world in which we live is a world that has officially rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ sitting at the Father's right hand in heaven's glory as the rejected, he's the rightful king of the universe, but he's the rejected one. He's the rightful savior of all men, but he's the rejected one. And as he sits at his father's right hand as the rejected king, his attitude toward the world is real important. What is his attitude toward this present evil world? It's an attitude of grace to you and peace. 
from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, it's extremely important to understand how God thinks about the world in which we live. And that's his attitude. Now, there's a contrast that you need to compare that with. Come with me to Revelation chapter number 19. Because this attitude of grace and peace is not always going to be God's attitude toward the world. In fact, it hasn't always been his attitude toward the world. Revelation chapter number 19. When the apostle John is caught into the future, into the event that we we call the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, back to planet earth. He says this. Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's Jesus Christ. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now think about that. One day Jesus Christ is going to come back to this planet. And when he does, he's going to come to judge and make war. The little bumper sticker, you see it sometime, it says, Will, will, will Jesus be your Savior or your judge. Well, the day he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and on them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to be a fearful day to fall in the hands of the living God. And he's going to come in an attitude of judgment and war. Now think for a minute. Grace and peace are the opposites of judgment and war. Grace is the opposite of judgment. Peace is the opposite of war. God's attitude toward the world today is exactly the opposite of what it will be when he comes back in wrath to destroy the unbelievers. That's real important. Come with me, if you will. Psalms chapter number 2 in one hand, and Acts chapter number 2. Psalm chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2. And let Let me make sure you understand why it is and when it is that God's attitude of judgment and war really... Uh, pertains and, uh, and why God's going to have that kind of, how it is that he could adopt the attitude of grace and peace. In Psalm chapter number 2, David writes, Why do the heathen rage and the people, that is the people, the nation Israel, imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel against the, the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter number 4, You'll find that passage in, in, Psalm, in the book of Psalms there is recorded and is quoted in the book of Acts as a reference to some things that took place during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes. He's God manifest in the flesh. He preaches to the nation Israel. And at the ends of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they take him out. They say, away with him. We'll have no king but Caesar. And they crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. And they reject their Messiah. John the Baptist had prepared his way, had called the nation to repentance. The Lord Jesus Christ came and presented himself to Israel, and they reject him. God the Father sent John the Baptist to the nation Israel. John the Baptist came, and he said, He that sent me said unto me, God the Father, John is the voice as a man sent from God. He's the voice of the Father calling Israel to repentance. Then, then, Then he sends his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, First, they reject the Father. When they reject John the Baptist, what do they do with John the Baptist? They allow Herod to cut his head off. They don't even raise a whimper when he silences the voice of God in their midst. Then they take God the Son, and they say, Away with him. We'll have no king but Caesar. Jesus told them, You blaspheme against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven you. But if you blaspheme against the, against the Holy Spirit, it won't be forgiven you. Not in this world or in the world to come. There's going to come a time out here. There's a kingdom that's coming out here. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for it. Thy kingdom come. John the Baptist told him to flee from the wrath to come. That, that time of tri- the tribulation we call that. When the Antichrist comes to, to, to uh, present the lie program to purge out the rubble out of Israel. Jesus Christ is going to come back in flaming fire taking wrath and vengeance on them that know not God. He's going to come to, to judge and make war against his enemies. And he tells them about it out there. And he says, you, you, blast him against the, you, you, you blast him against the Son of Man, and they do that at Calvary. He said, it'll be forgiven you. But you blast him against the, 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 the Holy Spirit, and it won't be forgiven you here or out there in that day. 
And so Jesus Christ dies at Calvary, is resurrected, ascends into heaven, sits down at the Father's right hand, and then sends the Holy Spirit down on, on the apostles. And they go out and they begin to preach to the nation Israel. And they, again, renew this opportunity of repentance for, for Israel. In Acts chapter number 4, quote Psalm 2 as a reference to Israel's rejection of, of the Lord and His anointed right back here. Now I want you to notice verse number 4, Psalm 2 verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Who's up there? Well, it's God the Father with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, sitting right next to Him up there in the heavens. He that sitteth in the, in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He shall speak to them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Now hold your hand there and come with me to Acts chapter 2. When Jesus Christ is rejected and goes back to sit at the Father's right hand, the, the prophetic scripture indicates that God's response to that rejection of Christ is going to be speaking to them in His wrath and vexing them in His sore displeasure. Why will He do that? Because they've rejected his son and crucified him, tried to break the bonds of God, the bands of God, asunder. Get rid of the authority of God. What was Satan's original sin? His original sin was to say, I don't want God's will for me. God created me for a purpose, but I've got a better idea. I don't want God's way. I want my own way. And Satan, Lucifer, introduced autonomy. Into the, into the universe. And that word sin, S-I-N, the problem is that middle letter. All we like our sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into his own way. That's that problem right there. That word right there is said to be what caused Satan to fall in to condemnation. Pride, I, sin. Israel over here. They've rejected Christ. Notice what happens. Acts chapter number 2, verse 34. Acts 2, 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The whole purpose of Peter's message on the day of Pentecost is to warn the nation Israel that this one they crucified, God raised up, resurrected him, and that he now sits at the Father's right hand in fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm 110, verse 1, God the Father said to his rejected son, Come and sit thou at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Now, there's a chair over here. If I go over here to the chair and I sit down, and I say to you, I'm going to sit here until it's time for me to go back and settle the debt with my enemies. And I'm sitting there, and as long as I'm sitting there, things are okay. But buddy, if I get up, why did I say I was going to get up? I'm going to get up to come make my foes my footstool. I'm going to come back to pour out my wrath and my judgment. Observe it. International version. King James Version, New American Standard. We have a great series of two tapes and six messages in regards to the King James issue and why it's something you need to really know and understand. The Bible business, Bible versions and perversions. Is your Bible the right Bible? The Bible's for you. The Golden Key, a threefold division. At the end of this message, you're going to get a 1-800 toll-free number that you can order this tape so that you can see through the Word of God the importance, the realization the King James Bible is the Bible for English-speaking people. Let's return to Richard Jordan now in this great message. I'm going to get up to come make my foes my footstool. I'm going to come back to pour out my wrath and my judgment on my enemies. Now go back up to verse number 16 of Acts chapter 2. Peter is describing what's going on the day of Pentecost. He says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Now that's interesting. Peter doesn't think that Pentecost has anything to do with, any, it, with a mystery. It has to do with prophecy. It's, it's, it's another step 
in the fulfilling of the prophetic program. You see, the coming of the John the Baptist was prophesied. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is prophesied. He'd be born of a virgin. He's going to be born in Nazareth. The timing element is, is prophesied. His crucifixion is prophesied. The things that, 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 that entail about it, his resurrection is prophesied. His ascension into heaven is prophesied. Psalm 110 verse 1, the coming of the Holy Spirit is prophesied. Each step along the way is prophesied. It shall come to pass in that day, in the last day, saith God. Verse 17 says, I will pour out upon, up, uh, uh, of my spirit upon all flesh. The coming of the Spirit is prophesied. Verse number 20, verse 19, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Uh, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. Notice in verse 17, God says, I will. Verse 19, I will. Peter says there's two, two basic things. I'm going to pour out my Spirit, then I'm going to pour out my wrath. Jesus Christ goes into heaven, sits down at the Father's right hand, pours out the Spirit of God, and says, I'm sitting there till it's time to pour out my wrath. Now that's, you can't, you can't miss that, even if you try. <laughs> you got to want to miss that to miss it. That's real simple. Now, come with me to Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7. When Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, is standing before the, the, the Senate and Council of Israel, the religious leaders of Israel, he has something very important to say. Because just as Israel had rejected God the Son, God the Father, and just as they'd rejected God the Son, they were also re had rejecting God the Holy Spirit. They were blaspheming against the Holy Spirit of God in, and in his testimony through the little flock. So Stephen warns them, verse 51, Acts 7, 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. You know who the uncircumcised are? They're the dreaded Gentiles. They're the people down here that are cut off and separated and alienated from God. Peter sa Stephen says to Israel, you guys are, are just like a bunch of cut off Gentiles down here, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Why? Because you resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. You guys are just blaspheming against what God the Holy Spirit's doing here. Now, when he did that, what happened? Well, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now, in Acts 2, when they heard what Peter said, they were pricked in their heart, and they said, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter tells them how to get saved. Here, they don't do that. Verse 54, they, were, they heard these things, they were cut in their heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. <laughs> they don't try to have Steve for dinner. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus. Now, I want you to notice very carefully, Jesus doing what? Standing on the right hand of God. And he says... Behold, I see the heaven open and the Son of Man standing. Now, I know what the preachers say. They say, well, the preachers, Jesus was standing to welcome Stephen the martyr home. Now, that's preacher talk. When preachers don't know what to say, they say goofy things like that. Okay? I, I, that's, I, I just tell you a secret about us preachers. When, when preachers don't know what to say, they just make up stuff to make, you know. And if, if, if Jesus had to stand up to welcome a saint home every time a faithful saint came home, he'd never get to sit down, folks. They're coming home all the time. No. What did Psalm 110, quoted in Acts 2, say that he was going to stand up for? Think about it. He said, come sit thou at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. According to prophecy, why was he going to get up? He was going to get up to come and make his enemies, his footstool, come and pour out his wrath, come and judge and make war against his enemies. That's why he was going to get up. You see, Israel had blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. They'd committed what Matthew 12 is referred to as the unpardonable sin, and there was no hope for them here or in the world to come. Now i got a question. It's been 2,000 years, approximately, since that took place. Where is the wrath and judgment? It hadn't come. You see why people, when they go back there and read that, they don't think it's real? They think it's all spiritual? 
it's all figurative, symbolic. They don't believe it's real and literal. You have to allegorize it. What happened is that at the moment when the, when, when the world stood ready for the wrath of God to be poured out, Jesus Christ ascends up far above all heavens and reaches down from up there and saves Saul of Tarsus, the chief enemy. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. Saves Saul and reveals to Paul a new program that through the fall of Israel, salvation is going to go to the Gentiles through a secret purpose that God had called the mystery. When he's going to form the church, the body of Christ, in the dispensation of the grace of God, where grace and peace are going to replace the attitude of judgment and war. And literally, what God does is He puts a big parenthesis in the prophetic program, in the sentence of prophecy. And a parenthesis interrupts the sentence with another thought and before the sentence is finished. God in literally interrupted the prophetic clock right at the moment when the wrath of God was ready to fall. Rather than this stuff not being real, it was real and literal, but God in His grace interrupted prophecy just as the moment. You know, you got that nuclear clock at the university in Chicago that they, they set up to tick right close. Just as that clock came to the moment on the, on the prophetic calendar of God to strike doomsday for this planet, this universe really, God interrupted it with the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Come with me to 1 Timothy, let me show you. 1 Timothy 1 began in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Notice Paul said, I was a part of that crowd over there, and I was a blasphemer. Who did he blaspheme? He blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. I thought the verse said, you can't, if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, there'd be no forgiveness in this world or that one. That's true. In order to save Saul of Tarsus, God had to change the program. He literally had to interrupt prophecy and introduce a dispensation that had previously not been talked about. Not been in the revelation, not been on, on, on the table. Introduce a new dispensation in here. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant by, with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners of whom I am chief. Paul wasn't the most wicked prolific that ever lived. Philippians 3 says his touching the law was blameless. He's talking about I was the one that was leading the world's rebellion against God himself. And God saved me. Why? Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. God took the chief of sinners and made him a pattern for you and me. You see, Jesus Christ died at Calvary to be the Savior of sinners. But friend, his perfect life is never a life you're going to be able to live. When you take your place over here with Paul, with the chief of sinners, <laughs> that's where you belong, isn't it? And you take your place with the chief of sinners and trust the Savior of sinners who died to pay for everything that's wrong with you. That's salvation. And Paul says, that's why God saved me. He interrupted this, this prophetic program just as the wrath of God was ready to fall. And he poured out his grace to you and his peace. From God the Father. You know what God the Father and God the Son's attitude up here is now? He went and sat back down. <laughs> and from the throne room of God, the message is grace, not judgment. It's peace, not war, as he forms the church, the body of Christ. As God takes believing sinners, willing to come, not, not trying to be a part of a special nation like Israel, and a part of a special religion like he gave the nation Israel, but just come before God as helpless, undeserving sinners. Paul said, while we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Are you without strength today? Have you come to the place where, where, 
where you've been beat and you know you can't make it on your own. Now, if you're still that religious crowd, see, you're back over here trying to be like Israel. Sooner enough, sooner or later, you're going to come to the place where you know you can't do it. When you come there, Paul said, oh, I got a message for you. When you were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what God does today is he offers his grace. He offers you everything that he's able to do for you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And he offers it to you by a gift, principle of grace. And you receive it by faith. God commended his love toward you and that while you're yet a sinner, Christ died for you. God desires to see your faith relying exclusively on his son. And the moment you do that, you'll be the recipient of his grace and his peace in Christ Jesus. My friend, that's the gospel, the good news of the wonderful grace of God that's available to you today in Christ, proclaimed by his word, rightly divided. And it gives you a place where your faith can rest in an intelligent understanding of what God's doing today and how it can work in your life. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a Bible introduction package we would like to give you absolutely free. No strings.